Well, I'm really excited to be speaking here. I'm actually also an alum. I graduated in 89. And I have a graduate student working on this project with me who's here, Esther Bowen. And she graduated from the college just two years ago and um, switched over from environmental studies into the sciences. So I'm very pleased to be talking to you about this today. Um, what I wanted to talk to you about is the project that we're working on, Feeding the City, but I also wanted to give you some background on that. And um, I can see already there's an error up here, but um, agriculture land use is a really big footprint on the planet. You see here a picture of ag lands, crops in yellow and areas that are mostly crops in this sort of mustard color. And it's really a dominant um, feature on the planet. And land use is directly relinked to the food choices that we make and how we grow our food. Another big effect um, associated with agriculture and the environment is nitrogen. So here I've just plotted the disruption of the nitrogen cycle by the use of fertilizers. And so this is just a measure of nitrogen fixation, how much nitrogen is actually being used. And you can see sort of the different um, categories here, beginning with lightning and then combustion, oceans, land. This is all the natural cycle right here. And then we get into the industrial, which we've disturbed, and then agriculture. And you can see that agriculture activity has completely disrupted the natural biogeochemical cycle. And this is just an example of an overwhelming effect of agriculture. So we have the land use issue, we have the nitrogen issue, and these are just two of them. Another that we'll hear more and more about is water use in agriculture. Agriculture in the United States is the largest consumptive user of water. But I want to come at it from a little bit different perspective, and I think that came out a little bit in the introduction that you heard about my research, and I want to tell you about my own motivation. So I've been trained as a geochemist, and I look, um, I did a lot of my work in past climate change, understanding the natural climate cycles from 10,000 years ago to a million years ago. And what you see up here is a plot of an ice core record. Um, it's oxygen isotopes, and actually what that is is a proxy for temperature change. So you can see all these wiggles going back and forth as changes in temperature as they're recorded in northern hemisphere ice sheets. And what we saw in there, the Holocene up there at the top, let me see if I have a laser pointer, is there, up there, this is the modern, and we're going back in time here. I was doing some work in this area right here. This is the last glacial cycle between 40,000 and 20,000 years ago. And these wiggles that you see translate into 10 degree temperature oscillations in the northern hemisphere. They occur on the time scale of decades. On the time scale of a human lifetime, we can see a natural switch in temperature of up to 10 degrees. Now this is a very different situation than we're in now. This is the last glacial cycle when we had large ice sheets. And it doesn't at all lead me to question whether or not what we're observing now is global warming. That's a completely different issue. But the point of this was that we saw these 10 degree oscillations. We have spent decades trying to understand them and we still don't understand them. This is a natural oscillation in the climate system that's very large that we don't have a really good handle on, yet we're doing this experiment of putting greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. Greenhouse gases are known to affect climate. And so with this natural experiment, who knows what will happen? Not knowing this right here motivated me to want to do a little bit more about what's going in the modern, as well as working to understand past climate change. And that was the link that drew me into agriculture. I had a long time um, interest in environmental sciences and in fact when I was an undergraduate here we didn't have an environmental sciences major so I ended up in the geophysical sciences department and really fell in love with these long-term climate cycles and um, the natural cycles of the earth and went off in that direction but now I've come back and I actually had um, the opportunity to create with one of my colleagues um, a major in the geophysical physical sciences for environmental sciences now. So now we do have a small major in that, so it's very exciting. 
But the topic on hand I wanted to focus on is the energy use in greenhouse gas, uh, gases in the food system. And I want to talk about two different ways of sort of envisioning or re-envisioning the food system. The first is understanding the effect to which personal choices can affect the impact of agriculture, and specifically personal dietary choices. And then I just, I don't want to spend too much time on it, but it's too exciting for me to not want to share that with you. And after that, I want to get on a little bit more towards this idea of the local food movement and trying to understand what sort of impact that might have on the environmental effect of agriculture, as well as the food system more generally. So energy use in the food system is quite high. Here you can, you can divide the pie of energy use in lots of different ways. And you can divide the pie of greenhouse gases in a lot of different ways. And because of this, you often hear in the newspapers, the built environment is 30% of the greenhouse gases. Or trans transportation is 30% of energy use. Or you can hear it in all different ways. And if you actually added up all those claims, you'd think we're up to like 250% that we're accounting for. And it's just because we divide the pie differently. All our activities can fall in different places. So here I have residential, but this is also the built environment. So we've sorted out here the energy use in agriculture. And this is measured in quads here. The total energy use in the US in quads, just to put it into perspective, is about 100 quads per year. The agriculture is about 10 quads per year. So agriculture in the food system is about 10% of the energy use that we have. Now directly associated with that energy use are greenhouse gases, and the primary one being carbon dioxide. So with all of this energy that's being used, we have a release of carbon dioxide, and also a little bit of a very potent greenhouse gas, nitrous oxides. But really the primary one from energy is the carbon dioxide. But when we're talking about the climate system and greenhouse gases, we have to talk, think about the other greenhouse gases that are involved here. And there's two big ones. There's nitrous oxide. In addition to that little bit that's in the fuel use, there's a lot of nitrous oxide associated with that change in land use. That first picture I showed you of how much agriculture activity Wherever we have agriculture activity, we've disrupted the natural nitrogen cycle. And by doing that, we've actually increased the nitrous oxide emissions, as well as the nitrate runoff, two different problems. Nitrous oxide is a very potent greenhouse gas, two to 300 times the potency of CO2. The other greenhouse gas is methane. And methane in agriculture, the primary source is from ruminants. Cows burp. Cows burping, that methane actually adds up. We can take a look at how that adds up. So this is the estimated total greenhouse gas emissions associated with the US system. So I want to focus that everything I'm talking about today is the US system. And it extrapolates pretty well to other developed countries, but it's a different issue in the developing nations. On the top there is the fossil fuels from the input energy. So that 10 quads of energy use in the food system translates into about 2.5 tons of CO2 per person per year. So to eat, the CO2 to feed us on average is 2.5 tons. Agriculture land management, this is the nitrogen oxide. This is the disruption of that nitrogen cycle. That's another one ton of CO2. So now we're up to three and a half tons of CO2. We can add in that little bit more, the 0.4 from the enteric fermentation, primarily the ruminants, the cows burping. The waste management, this is both some methane and some nitrous oxide. Again, directly attributed to animals. It's the animal waste we're talking about, the anaerobic decay of that. And then a tiny little bit of rice cultivation, rice paddies emit methane. We add all this up and we get to four tons of CO2 per person per year. Now to put that into perspective, if we take the total emissions of the US and divide that by the population of the US, our per person carbon footprint is about 20, 22 tons of CO2. So four out of 20 tons of CO2 is directly related to diet. Yeah? 
It is. This is, we have very little, and I guess it, it won't be as high as this. That's a really good, yeah. It could be, it could get up to the waste management level, and that's a really good point. So this is the estimated, this is from the U.S. The EPA, and it's an, a very important point because we think about our carbon footprint as our emissions. But when we, the way we really need to think about our carbon footprint, our water footprint, our nitrogen footprint, is actually in our total consumption. And we have rice that's coming from China. We have tennis shoes that are coming from China. We have think, clothing coming from India. And all these things add up to emissions. And so when we actually want to go and calculate our footprints, we ought to be adding that in there. No, and this is just for the, the US. Um, it is. This is a lower bound estimate. And on everything I'm showing you today, it's a lower bound estimate of what the changes can be. That was a really great question. So we can translate this energy use, if we take just the energy part again now, into an efficiency of the food system. How much energy goes into it versus how much energy are we getting out of it? And we get that energy in edible calories. That's pretty easy, right? Like a Snickers bar has some calories in it. And so really we're saying how many Snickers bars are we getting out of the system? So the, this small green band right here is the edible output. So for the 10 quads, a little over 10 quads that we've accounted for, we're getting a little about uh, one and a half quads out of it. So the efficiency is less than 13% or less than 15% for the efficiency of the current food system. So, but these edible calories that we're looking at right here are actually the calories that are delivered to us that are on the shelves. That's 3,800 calories per person per day. So this bar right here represents 3,800. That's a huge number of calories. Our consumption is anywhere between 17 and maybe 25, 27 per person, depending on activity levels and how much we're consuming. So this efficiency, again, is an overestimate because we need to account for that waste in the food system. So the efficiency of the food system is quite low. Yes? And is it possible for the efficiency to be over 100%? Yes. That's a good question. So if we look at the energy efficiencies of food items, and that was the right next slide that you had there, um, this is looking at dividing the food items up into different um, categories. And so we have the red meats, or the meats down here in red, the fish here in blue, and plants and produce down here in green. And so what we say for um, we can have a 10% efficiency. That means we're going to get one calorie out when we put 10 fossil fuel units in. But we can get your over 100%, like a 200%, to get two calories of edible food out for each fossil fuel calorie we put in. And that comes from plants. That's because we don't need to necessarily give them everything because they're actually taking the energy. But the animals have to use that energy, so their efficiency is naturally lower in this way of, of thinking about it. So right away, looking at this, just in terms of energy use, we can get the idea that there are some diets that are more energetically efficient than others. Now, we probably don't all want to just be eating soy. Okay. <laughs> but it's still good to understand what the impact of our decisions are. And so you can see that it goes down this way. And the part that really surprised me was the fish. So the fish can be very low here. Um, uh, very low, like the tuna or the salmon, which is farmed. Long line fishing takes a lot of energy to go out there and get it and bring it back. Farmed fishing takes a lot of energy to be bringing the food to the fish. However, herring, something like that, actually has a pretty high efficiency. It's a coastal fish. So we can eat our herring, we can eat our sardines and feel OK if the reason we're concerned about these things are the environment. We can just go off the coast and grab them in some areas. And even if those areas aren't close to us, they pack them right away, and you can ship them off on a boat, which is one of the most um, efficient forms of transporting food. So it turns out to be pretty good in the end. Now that's the energy efficiency, and we have to talk about just one other aspect of it. And that's the 
emission, I have energy emissions here, but this is the emissions efficiency of food. So in addition to that energy that went in, we have to account for those other greenhouse gases. We need to account for nitrous oxide um, from the land use involved. And actually, that one's a little difficult. And because there's a lot of decision making in, uh, associated with it, we can actually set that aside and just account for the greenhouse gases that are different between vegetables and animals. And what I mean is we can just think about the methane emissions and the nitrous oxide from the manure management. And so we can get a, at a lower bound of the um, greenhouse gas emissions of food items. So when we add in that CO2 due to the different energy efficiencies, the methane from the ruminants and the nitrous oxide from dealing with manure management, what we see is that we can get an incredibly different emissions efficiency for two different meals. So this was actually a calculation we did from Mark Bittman in the New York Times. Um, we calculated out a stir fry dish um, versus a six ounce beef steak. They had 320 calories, so it's an equivalent meal here. I think the calorie might be a little bit low, but uh, for the picture they put on there. But in terms of the calculations, they were for 320 calories each. Um, we did it for broccoli, eggplant, cauliflower. We added some rice in there. We see that the, if we put it in CO2 equivalent, so if we tr translate those nitrous oxides and the methane into how much effect they would have if they had been CO2, just a way to account for the greenhouse gases, the stir fry would have 180 grams of CO2 equivalent for that dish, and the meat dish, 4.4 kilograms of CO2 a factor of 24 difference in greenhouse gas emissions. So it's to point out that dietary choices can have a huge impact on the, the emissions associated with diet. Now we actually modeled some diets to put it into some perspective for you. So along, and from this graph, a little bit complicated, but it's fun because you can calculate the Impact, the emissions impact of almost any diet on here. You go from eating no meat to eating 50% meat. Um, usually when it's the students here, we say you eat like a Texan, but I better be a little careful. So <laughs> it's just from zero to 50%. And then you can choose the type of diet you have. You can eat like the average American, which is a mixture of meats, or you can have only fish, you can be vegetarian except you have eggs and milk, and then poultry, you only eat chicken, and then finally red meat. And I can say there have been phases in my own life where I have like chosen each of those diets for various reasons at some point. 27%, that's the average meat consumption. So if we follow this line up to the mean US diet, the difference between that and not consuming any meat at all in your diet is about one and a half tons of CO2. If you decided to drive a Prius instead of your standard car of a Camry, that would be a savings of about a ton of CO2. So you can actually save more in terms of greenhouse gases by switching your diet than switching your car in some cases. Now, this has been something that I had a real lesson in dealing with the press on this because they really picked up on this idea of, of comparing it to a car. And it was kind of funny. There are those people who didn't want to give up their meat, but there are those other people who didn't want to give up their SUVs. And so it turned out that the statistic had been quoted at some point of being, if you were vegan, you could go ahead and drive your SUV. <laughs> That's not the case. <laughs> but maybe if you, you know, ate like our Texan <laughs> or 50% red meat in your diet, okay, well, maybe that is like giving up an SUV. Unfortunately, um, not only does Texas have a lot of meat, red meat consumption, they've got a lot of SUVs as well. <laughs> so, so this was really um, the first choice we thought about, you know, 
dietary choices. And this was just some of them. And you can talk about prepared foods versus unpre you know, eating fresh from the farmer's market. There's lots of different choices. And the point was, is not to preach about everyone going vegan. I am not vegan. I eat those sardines and herring that are next to the coastline. It's just so that we're aware. We need to be aware of the choices and the consequences of those choices. Just like they've shown that putting these little kilowatt devices in your house and plugging things in and seeing how much energy your different um, your light bulb takes and your refrigerator break takes can reduce energy consumption, I feel like if we understand the impacts of our other choices, that too can help us to reduce our impact. Now, the other natural choice that we started thinking about after that was transportation. Because what we've been hearing a lot about is eating locally. And in fact, Esther did a lot of her thesis, her undergraduate thesis work on trying to understand how to make choices between if you have to choose, if you're a buyer, and she specifically said, I want to do something practical. And so, okay, so she went to the dining hall and said, I want to talk to the buyer and I want to find out how he chooses to meet his sustainable purchasing when all he has between choices between are local and organic. And so she had to weigh these. She said, I can get a lot of stuff from California and it's organic. I can also get this other stuff locally, but it's not organic. And this was one of the hard choices. And it turned out to be close, that a lot of things were actually better if you bought them local versus if you bought them organic in terms of energy use. Because for food, a big part of that energy use is embedded in putting those fertilizers and pesticides on them. And so when you buy local, you don't have that. I mean, when you buy organic, you don't have that. When you buy local, it's, well, maybe you're missing some of that transportation. And so here, you can see this is our current food system. Now, despite an enormous amount of our land being uh, agriculture in the US, Esther, what's the number? OK, like nearly 50% of the land in the US is devoted to agriculture. You can see that portion of it in the green here that's actually devoted to produce. Most of that other land is devoted to feed grains, soy and corn for feeding animals. So there's a very small portion of the land use that's actually dedicated to um, people. But you look at this and you see where the produce is coming from, say, for Chicago. And we calculated. In fact, Esther started the calculations. And then we had a couple high school students last year, one from the lab school. Actually, I think both of them were from the lab school. Um, they helped create a model based on USDA data to model how far food is traveling and to try to calculate it from different cities. And we came up with 1,800 miles. That's your average piece of produce in your diet. So it's weighted for the transportation mode, and it's weighted for how much of that you might eat, like how likely you are to have a banana versus an apple. Um, and that was the actual, that was the savings. So it seems like there could be some potential savings in buying locally. But it is small. If we look here, um, this is that 10 quads of energy in the food system. And we can break that down and think about it as a life cycle analysis. We hear a lot now about life cycle analysis in the newspaper, and that's just understanding the impact from the whole process of creating something and then getting rid of it. Well, this is the life cycle analysis for the food system. It's missing a couple stages, but it's one of the best estimates. It's from 2003, and what we see down here at the bottom is agriculture production. So about 20% of that, this is that 10 quads, goes to agriculture production. The next little bit of it is the transportation in the food system. So this is that potential savings we're looking at. And then we have processing, some packaging, retail. And then you can see there's a huge chunk at the household. So all of these things represent potential places to save energy in the food system. If we think about local, you know, are we just thinking about this transportation? And in fact, a paper came out after the one I wrote with my colleague, Gidon Eschel, that looked again at the different diets, red meat and other parts of the diet. They looked at a few more things in there. And they came to the conclusion that, well, indeed, red meat, switching from red meat to other um, uh, dietary items 
could be a huge climate savings, impact savings for you. And they were just comparing here in the big, the bars at the end, the greenhouse gases from production. So that's the purple, the blue, and the orange. And then they said that these little tiny bars here were the freight. So they came to the conclusion that if you just bought local, all you're doing is eliminating this transportation, this, the CO2 and, um, associated with that transportation, and it's very small compared to the rest. Yes? Um, under that household storage and preparation, yeah. is that like refrigeration? Yeah, refrigeration is a huge part of it, and then you add onto it all of our toaster ovens and microwaves and stoves. Um, Stoves actually are the worst out of those three. You know, if you can use your toaster oven, that's a really good thing. And if you can use the toaster instead of the toaster oven, you have even more of a savings. Yeah. Okay, so what if I stick a goat in my backyard? That's right. So if you stick a goat in your backyard, what have you changed? Well, I'm looking at, I'm guessing that some of the grain, that like if I really grasp feed, if I need that, okay. Like, okay, that I'm guessing that that really curve is going to shrink somewhat. Um, but I'm just wondering. That's it exactly. And that's the same criticism we had and a few others had about thinking about local this way. Because local is, you're not driving it from somewhere. But it could also mean that you've changed the whole food system around it. In your case, you have a goat in your backyard that is eating grass instead of grain that you've had to grow and transport in. Um, you're, if you have just one goat, you're less likely to be having to give it lots of antibiotics, which are energy intensive. So your emissions of that does go way down. Now for any ruminant, there's still going to be greenhouse gases associated with the, the cud. And it turns out it's not as all straightforward if you're not talking about your backyard goat, but you're talking about grass-fed cattle. But I think we'll stay away from that. But that was the point exactly. The point is, is it, should we just be thinking about what a local food system is, is only eliminating transportation? And we decided to look at that. And that takes me into sort of the second part of the research that we've been doing with the students, and that's looking at the local food system. We wanted to really understand how do these things change when we talk about Know Your Farmer, which is a big program now the USDA has, the idea of buying from the farmer's market, the idea of local agriculture. What does that really mean? Now there's pros and cons. There's a lot of feeling that we have in our stomachs that this could be good. But there's very little hard data on it. And they, there could be some drawbacks. It could be efficiencies. It could be that our yields are much lower when we do it this way. It could be if you're only having a little bit, maybe transportation is actually less efficient. But we wanted to take a look at that because it wasn't at all simple. The reason we knew that it would at least come out close is that we took a group of undergraduates maybe four years ago for 10 days to a, fa a small farm in upstate New York. And they opened up their record books for us. And along with visiting sort of all the local farms in that area, the students would come back in the afternoon and pour through these records. And we added up all the energy use on the farm, tried to account for all the material inputs as best as we could in a 10-day period, and then looked at how much this farm produced. And what we realized is that it seemed to be pretty close to conventional, just doing this quick pass. And so it had potential that we knew that it wasn't an outright loser. And that was the first thing we wanted to make sure, that we weren't going down a track that was obvious. So the other thing we wanted to eliminate in starting this is what's possible? I mean, great. So we want to develop local food systems. But the first question really is, what can we do locally? So this is a map. Um, the colors are beautiful on the screen, and they always turn out kind of funny. But um, the salmon are the population areas. And we were really interested in a case study of, is it possible to feed a metropolitan area? Chicago was a great one to do for this. It's a little easier than the others, because you can see the other large urban population areas are Milwaukee over here. We have a couple of big cities over here, down here, and here. But they're not right on top of one another. So each of these are urban areas. And what you see there in green are the farm is the farmland in Illinois. And in Illinois, over 90% of that farmland you're looking at is either corn or soy. It's commodity crop. But we have a lot of acres of it. 
So we wanted to know if we took some of these acres and switched them to diversified produce production, could we have enough around us to actually feed the city? So we looked at the land requirements for the U.S. diet. And in this case, we did go beyond the U.S. Uh, to go after the first question we had a while ago, because we really wanted to make, to account for how much land it would take. So we had the acres for fruit production and the, divided by the U.S. population, and that's how much land it takes to grow produce. Acres for food grain and acres for feed grain, that's really hard. In, as I said, in Illinois, over 90% of our land is corn and soy, and it turns out a lot of that is feed grain. So we wanted to divide out what portion of that is for direct consumption versus what portion is for the animal. And that turned out to be a whole paper in and of itself, the calculations over here. They're not important, but the point is that we did divide them up. We decided how much of this goes to animals, how much is going to go to people. And this is the bottom line. So this is the per capita mean American diet. This is another way of looking at what we eat. So in kilocals per day, there's that 3,700 or 3,800 calories that are delivered to all of us. A thousand are coming from the animal feed. Remember that was about the 30%. 2,300 actually are grain for food. So we're getting 2,300 calories from different grains in our diet, often processed, but nonetheless from grains. And 360 from fruits and vegetables. Now I'll note that this is the mean American diet you know, accounting for waste, and after we account for that waste, we're not actually meeting the U.S. dietary suggestions for the amount of produce we should have in our diet. But this is what we have, so we want to do this for this food system as it exists right now. So we're interested in some point at transportation, so we just divided that out into the weight of all the items, and you can see that in terms of the weight or the mass of the items, it breaks down fairly evenly, even though the calor calories are very different. Yeah? Why do you account for the waste in figuring out if, it can, if the land around Chicago can support the city? Say that again? Why do you account, also account for the waste? So we, what we're doing is we're trying to do a, a calculation that is mimicking as much as it can the food system as it exists right now. Now there are idealized ways of growing things extremely efficiently. We can go through all sorts of engineering feats and we can think about um, supplementing things with hydroponics, for example, or we can think of very efficient um, cropping systems. But we're not after that. What we're after is saying this is the system and this is the way it's being pushed right now. It's being pushed by policy towards local. So let's just start out the calculation saying everything's the same and then start looking. And that's exactly one place where there could be savings. Because if it's coming from locally, the first thing we know, at least for these perishables, are that we're going to be losing less of those perishables. Um, if you're picking from a garden, or you pick down the block, or you're coming from a farmer's market, you might end up having less waste in this way. Um, and the waste that does exist gets recycled by the farmer pretty quickly. Um, if we go to the end, though, this is the interesting number. Um, this is acres per year. So for the meat portion of the diet, and this is primarily for the feed grain, it's about a half an acre per person per year. For the food, grain for food is 0.16 and 0.03 for fruits and vegetables. 0 0.03 acres per year per person to provide us with the, food, the fruits and vegetables that we're getting right now. And we are shipping this from California, from Mexico, and other places. Does that really, is that really necessary? And so we mapped this out, knowing this. And we took the urban centers um, for the whole area, because we wanted to make sure by feeding Chicago, we weren't starving the rural areas. And we have the urban centers here. This was the land we um, ended up using. So they had 42 million acres. And if you used 0.76 acres per person, accounted for the whole diet, you'd still, you'd only be using 60% of the cultivated land. So Illinois, or this region, could still be exporting grain and, you know, supporting, having, being subsidized for those commodity crop productions. Um, 
So it is possible. So now we, we did our preliminary analysis and said, OK, well, you know, it looks like small farms can be at least nominally as efficient as conventional agriculture at a first pass. We said it is possible to develop a regional food shed here. How would we do this, and what would it look like? Before you go on, yeah. uh, not all land is suitable for vegetables, for example. I have a farm in Oklahoma mm -hmm. to raise wheat on. That's right. It for 100 years and so forth. That's the only thing it's really good for. That's right. And, 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 and vegetables are fine. When you get carrots in California, which are much superior, you need to have a And you're, it seems to me that you're getting, reducing your quality when you do this. So what we're, I think what we're doing is maybe reversing, um, reducing our diversity of our diet. And the idea is to first say, what sort of diversified produce can we get here? We don't advocate. That gets a good, at a good point. I don't suggest that anyone eliminate oranges from their diet. Oranges grow most efficiently in Florida, and we should get them from there. Carrots, now I might argue because we get some really good carrots locally. <laughs> but you know, there are items that do come from other areas. And so that's the point. That's, that's at the heart of this. We want to understand to what extent it makes sense to build out regional food sheds. What would a robust food system look like? And a robust food system might be one where we're growing some of the things that can grow locally, locally feeding our local population, still bringing things in, and now what would the efficiency of that system look like? But it's not very simple. We have to actually break it into the various parts, and that's kind of what we're doing right here. And to get at your point that not all land is equivalent, actually we redid our calculation here now to think about doing this just for produce and grain for human consumption, and we said take the urban centers, take the prime farmland, and use that to map out production. Another point to that is that if you look at where specialty crop, and by the way, produce is considered a specialty crop by the USDA. So if you look to see where food is growing now in Illinois or in Massachusetts or in New York, anywhere out of the Central Valley really, it's often growing on marginal farmlands rather than the prime farmlands. The farmers who have done this have been pushed off into the marginal areas. And so we look at things like the yields from these farms, and we have to remember that they're coming from some of the least desirable farmland sometimes. So we looked at this, and we mapped out what food sheds would look like. So we started with the smallest ones, and if we're thinking about efficiency first, um, we decided that we want to think about the smallest urban centers because those are the ones that have the least amount of transportation to them. And actually a really interesting thing came out of our research as we were researching the idea of a food shed. The idea of a food shed came out in the early 1900s and it stemmed from a graduate student who was participating in a seminar in the econ department here at the University of Chicago. And then he went on to a East Coast school to finish up his PhD or maybe do a postdoc and turn this into a book, How Great Cities Are Fed. And what came out of that is in 1927, they estimated that food was traveling something like 15, 1,600 miles to come to Chicago on average. But we know there's been big changes in the food system since then. And so pouring through the records, what we realize is that one of the big changes in the food system are in these rural areas. We're now bringing more food to the rural areas than we used to bring. These farms used to always have backyard gardens or neighborhood gardens, and now that has been less and less. And so we actually have more food coming into there, and that's one of the least efficient parts of the transportation system because you have to take it to the hub, and then you have to take it down to this small place. So we ended up mapping out these food sheds, and the, we'll get to the Chicago food shed right here. And so this in yellow is what could be considered the land necessary to provide all the produce and grain, not the, um, the feed grain, but the food grain to the city of Chicago and the surrounding urban area. So again, it was possible. And I want to skip a little bit ahead because I'm 
Um, we have looked at transportation and optimizing the system that way because we want to think about that life cycle analysis and transportation is that second part. But it's a little out of order and I think the more exciting thing that I want to tell you to finish up with is what we've been doing with our student interns these past two years. So now that we had it mapped out and said it's feasible, we wanted to know what it would actually look like. We want to essentially say of that life cycle analysis, that bottom box is agriculture production. Is a local food system going to use the same amount of energy and have related greenhouse gas emissions for that box? Is it going to be a larger box because it's more inefficient or will it be smaller? So we started out small as a pilot study. We're building the study now. But we had four rural farms and four urban farms, which I don't have mapped here in the study. Um, one of the farms is Genesis Farms, and Genesis Farms is actually one of the farms that's providing food for our reception after I finish talking here. Um, and we'll see a picture of Vicki Westerhoff, who's been farming out there for over a decade. Um, but these farms um, ranged from 2 to 20 acres, and they were highly diversified in produce. So they have 40 to 300 varieties of vegetables growing on these farms. Already, this is a sign that the Weber and Matthews, who said local is simply changing that transportation, was wrong. When we talk about know your farmer, or when you go to the farmer's market and you see the sellers there, um, even when you go to Whole Foods and you see the local food in there, these are the types of farms that the food is coming from. Conventional is one or two crops monocropping, just the way soy and corn is really, with just a few varieties. But the farmers here have multiple varieties and they do that for multiple reasons. They want to ensure against drought versus a wet year that they're going to have some crop for people, heat, if it's going to be heat, if you're going to have a long or short season, and for pest control. They rotate these crops really frequently and that way they don't build up a pest, you know, there's not the same pest that's left over in the soil to destroy their whole crop. And there are even some theories about better nutrient use in here. And that's actually what Esther, my graduate student, is going to be looking at. She's going to try to understand, to quantify the extent to this changes the resilience of a system, how robust it is to these different possible changes. But we looked at these farms. We have the four rural ones mapped out. And they all followed some self-identified sustainable practices. For the most part, they were organic. We don't say that because they're, they are just working on their certification in some cases. Some of them are organic already. But that's not all they do. And that would be selling them pretty short to say organic. Because they do manual uh, pest control and uh, the high variety, no-till. They have fallow land. They have lots of practices. Previous work, those numbers that I showed you about the energy efficiency of food, came primarily from Pimentel, who's a scientist at Cornell University. It's an interesting, I met, I met him for the first time a year ago, and it was very exciting because it turned out that all of his initial work has stemmed from the same type of way we're gathering our, our data here now, that he had a group of undergraduate students, and he tasked them with going out and figuring out the energy efficiency, but in their case, they were looking at conventional crops, monocropping. And they looked at all the inputs and how much you got out of it in the end to try to calculate an efficiency of this food. And you can do this in other ways, by the way. We've been talking about calories, but our work goes beyond calories. We look at proteins. We look at carbohydrates. We can look at um, nutrients now. There's, you, know, you can divide the diet up in all these different ways. This is just a, a convenient way to talk about it. This approach wouldn't work with these diversified farms, and it's why this has never been done before. We did a whole farm study. We went to the farm, and we wanted to account for everything that was growing there. Uh, we wanted to do a full input-output analysis. This work involves a colleague of mine who's an environmental economist, and we came up with this question, essentially, about the relationship between economic efficiency and environmental efficiency. We know there's generally, actually, an inverse relationship when you rely heavily on fossil fuels. And we're wondering if there might be a more direct relationship if we take that out of there. Um, so we're addressing some other questions with that. But for this study, what we wanted to do was to sum up all these inputs. How much energy are they using on the farm? 
what materials are there and how much energy did it take to get to create and bring those materials there and then how much labor is on the farm and finally what did they actually produce and what did they actually produce is the hard part so here's Vicki Westerhoff who's provided us with some greens for this afternoon and one of our undergraduate interns in her hoop house and she's converted these into passive hoop houses there's she doesn't use heat I believe in this one and in the winter, she puts a false ceiling on this, and then she lays row row uh, fabric over these things. We went out there in uh, maybe was it January, negative 10 degrees, negative 5 degrees. She whips up the cover, and there is just a sea of green. It was amazing. She is growing this stuff not far from here. You saw on the map, within 100 miles of here, <coughs> 60 miles of here, and this can grow all season long, with the exception of December and January and why we saw that is because it can just hang out it doesn't grow anymore during that time because it gets light limited but in terms of temperature that's a problem they've overcome pretty easily so we looked at all these different um, inputs and the indirect energy might be the one just to spend a little bit more time on that's the energy that's used in manufacturing and transporting things to this food shed that's that's right up here and um, the labor is pretty straightforward. And the uh, output, we're right now, again, just doing this in terms of caloric output. So we add up all the calories in the different items. And that turned out to be tricky in and of itself. So this is a box from, I don't think this is from Vicky CSA, but it's from one of the other farms that had hosted an intern over the summer. And this was just one layer of the box that they had. But it gives you the idea that this is what we want to account for when we want to account for yield. We want to know how many radishes there are and how much parsley there is and how much arugula there is. We want to know all of it in there, charred. So we actually had to come up with our own metric of comparing yields from these farms. So what we did is we, took, we figured out the equivalent land use. We said we know how much each, well, the, the students. We had an intern at each of these farms. And a big part of their job was actually making sure we knew how many pounds of carrots were grown in the year and how many pounds of potatoes. Um, we took the mass of each of those items over the whole year and we divided it by conventional yields. So what is the yield for carrots to the whole food system? And we did this for each item and we came out with how much land would it have used had it been grown conventionally? And then here is the relative yield. We have the equivalent land use divided by actual production. And it looks like I left the, the calculation, the actual number off of here, but I can show you it and talk about it right here. In doing this, what we found is that here's now the produce zone in green right here. And this is the rest is the grain production. What we found from these, and now it's a limited number of farms for just one year, I know that. <laughs> But from these four farms that are urban and four farms that are rural, we had efficiencies that ranged from the low end of about 50% to a high end of about 125%. It turns out that the, uh, the farms that are in the city were actually more efficient than conventional farms. Yes? 125% efficiency? Yes. And that's perpetual motion. No, 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 no. Land use efficiency relative to conventional. So conventional would be they're the same, maybe a factor of one. So yeah, no, I can understand. It's sound. wow, that's great. <laughs> um, yeah, so the urban farms actually have a higher yield, essentially, higher land use efficiency than conventional farms. And the rural farms ranged. Right here, we remapped this out saying, OK, so let's use our worst case scenario of 50% yield on these small scale diversified farms. That's using that 50%. This is the amount of land that we would need to grow diversified food locally. Now, again, I'm not trying to eliminate bananas or oranges from a diet. In fact, I'm not even necessarily saying I'm trying to change anybody's diet. We set out to try to understand whether this makes sense. We've had issues with agriculture in the back, and it's recognized now that there are big problems with the current agriculture system. The question is, how are we going to improve it? And one of the solutions that's being put around is the idea of establishing regional food sheds. 
And so we really want to know the answer to that question. So here we have a decrease for the worst farms in yield, yet still not incredibly low in terms of what one might expect. Right here in yellow is the grain shed that would be necessary. And actually, I hadn't remapped this, so this is twice as large as our grain shed needs to be. Turns out that when we looked at the grain efficiency, not from our farms, but just for Illinois, we had originally halved it to say that, okay, well, any of, just in case that the production is lower here for our initial mapping, let's use twice as much land. But actually, we don't need twice as much land for grain because Illinois is weighting the averages for grain. So what I have mapped out here is actually enough for the whole diet if all of us want to eat vegan. So if they cut off the airport and cut off food coming for everyone else, just save us this much land and we're going to be fine. <laughs> now, I don't advocate that, but it is showing that it is possible. So this is what we have using the local yields. Now, what is our next? So um, we know now that we have, that it's possible in terms of land. The next thing we want to know in terms of the environment is actually how would this change when we think about multiple environmental um, parameters. If we think about the soil and we think about water use and we think about how the different crops are going to be and we think about this is a model for water and soil and it has nutrients in it, if we think of all these things, convert this land from commodity crop to some of this ag production, what will the footprint, what will the impact of that be? And that is really the next step for these this modeling that we have. Now we have it laid out how it could look. Now let's take it to the next step and say, okay, if we do this, what will the impact be? And so that's the next step that we want to do in terms of the environmental modeling. But there's still another aspect of the data we've collected already, and that's an input analysis, and that we looked at the output first. We said, how much food did they grow? Now let's step back and say for these farms, how much energy did they use? What about the energy and the embedded materials? And so we did a preliminary look at the energy efficiency. This was definitely harder than we thought it would be. Um, but we did come up with some interesting numbers. So for direct energy use, this is the direct fuel use on the farm. Electricity for lighting for our refrigerator. Um, maybe there was some fuel for some of the people who didn't use these passive hoop houses. The urban farms had 10 to 30 percent of the energy use of conventional farming. And I want to point out that this is on an item per item basis. Just the way we calculated the yields, we said, how much energy does it take to grow apples conventionally? How much energy does it take to grow broccoli conventionally? And so we added up how much energy use this farm would have taken to produce this conventionally. And they, the urban farms, ended up using 10 to 30 percent of it. The rural farms had 30 to 100 percent of it. It's something interesting as far as economies of scale here. There's economies of scale in terms of dollars, and then we also have economies of scale in terms of environment, and they may not be the same. Yes? What was the average size of the So, yeah, so if we don't, that's a great question, and that's one of the questions we want to get at as we expand this. For the urban farms, they're all quite small. They're all um, maybe less than an acre, yeah. And the rural farms, we did have one that was about two acres. It actually wasn't um, the most efficient. Um, we had a couple that were 20 acres, around 20 acres, and those seemed to be a pretty good efficiency. But, you know, it's really hard to say, but that's a great number that we want to know. We want to kind of understand what is the economy of scale in terms of the environment. And we have the economists involved because we also want to know the economy of scale in terms of the economics as well. Yes? Yeah, um, I haven't done a lot. I've been growing my own fruits and vegetables there. Usually, and I'm, I'm, I'm an extremely lazy person, so uh -huh. I just feel I should know, people should know that. I am harvesting already certain things like rhubarb and onions, uh -huh. which are, that are left over from last year. But usually I can spend two or three months almost never going through the produce aisle. That's kind of what I measure. In other words, mm -hmm. in July, August, and September, I go grab a lemon, and that's it. Yep. And you don't eat the same things. Right. That's, That's the point. You have to understand. You won't eat the same things. Yeah. And so what we've been doing is saying a diversified diet. Again, this is the difference between saying what is technically possible. Um, the Rocky Mountain Institute is this institute that focuses on efficiency. They have this gorgeous home office building 
The guy has monkeys and banana trees there. It's very efficient. I don't think that's going to work for the rest of us. Not for a while. It took a lot of capital investment to do that. So what we're looking at is what actually is going on with the movement. And it's like what you said. It's you eat different foods. But it doesn't mean we have to eliminate those other foods. It only says let's rely more heavily on the foods that we can nearby and think about those other items what they are, understand what the footprint of those items are, and maybe reduce their consumption. Yes? I think this is interesting, but we're having so much trouble keeping people um, living on farms to, to do the work so that you're getting all these calculations, but the average farmer is going under. That's right. That's so how can... I mean, what right. basis is this? Well, that's it. And so actually, that is part of the motivation in doing this work. So as I said, we want to go back and we want to do this environmental footprint of it. Because the only metric I've talked about so far is energy and then maybe, you know, I don't think we'll get there, a little bit of greenhouse gas as the metrics. But there are other environmental metrics. There's water quality. There's um, water use. There's soil conservation. There's biodiversity. And these farms, these small scale farms, actually have rows of flowers on them in order to have pollinators. They could be the only farm for miles and miles and miles where you see this because you are in a sea of soy and corn. So they are actually providing pollination services for a very large area. Um, yes? You but, keep convincing. Okay. 25% of it is magnificent. I'm going to make more of my own response. It's going to cost me, let's say, you turn the capital. Like That's right. Price. How many hours of labor am I going to have to put in? That's right. Those are exactly the, yes. That's exactly the question. So to answer the first part of it, no, you're right. It's, you're saying that it's not efficient economically. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So one is let's account for these. Let's see what these environmental services are. If they're not significant, then this doesn't make sense. If these are significant, then these are ecosystem services that are provided by these farms, and these farmers ought to be compensated for it. Why, isn't it. why is it efficient to grow corn and soy right now and not this food? Because corn and soy are heavily subsidized. Why not give the farmers subsidies based on what they're actually providing? They're providing food, but these farms are also providing ecosystem services. Now, I don't know that this is going to work. We haven't done the final calculation yet. But it ought to be part of what we're thinking about. We have to think beyond a simple economic efficiency that's relying, relying on fossil fuels and those externalities of climate change and the externalities of, of nutrient runoff and soil runoff are not considered. And so we need to consider them. We don't know the answer, but that's where we want to go. There's also, okay, go ahead. You have a question. So, okay. So there's the other part of it, and that's with the urban farm. Hey, this sounds great, 125%. I can use my land. Isn't this wonderful? Farm, land in the city is very expensive. That's one thing. So does it really make sense to be growing in the city a lot of food? Well, maybe not, but... We actually have a lot of vacant land in the city right now. We actually have a lot of people who need jobs. So the things that are surviving in the city are not farms that have just the mission statement of growing food for the north side. The farms are those that have multiple mission statements. And one of the most successful that we're seeing is growing home. So growing home is um, on Wood Street. It's very close to campus here. We had an intern last year. And in fact, one of the crew leaders is a student from the UFC who hired on there for this year. And we have two interns there. They have a work program. This is a work reentry re program. So they have a value added in terms of social capital. They're training these people. They're providing that. And they're doing it via f growing food. What happens to that food? Well, some of it's going to restaurants that they can't afford to eat at. But there's also that amount of the food that's staying in the neighborhood. They're being involved in food production. If they have backyards, they now may end up farming in their backyard. They may be pushing for a community garden. So that's another whole benefit. That's not, you know, it's not exactly an ecosystem benefit. It's more of a social services benefit. And again, that's another whole aspect of the urban side of this project, to seeing whether it can be economically viable. Because he's right, it's not economically viable right now 
as the system exists. And so that's why we are going through each of these steps. Yes? It seems to me like quantifying that would be almost impossible, but calling it cultural services would be fairly obvious to demonstrate because there is great public interest in doing stuff like this, and a lot of people are going to nurseries and looking at stuff and trying to figure out soil amendments. Mm -hmm. And the culture's changed, and you can see it by the amount of advertising on different it is diffi difficult to value, and uh, I guess a benefit of doing this type of research here versus maybe at U of I, where they're not thinking about this type of ag, is that we have people who think about these things that are hard to value. I know two, I know an economist and then a professor at the law school who both specialize in valuing difficult to value things, and one of them are the social services, for example. The study she did last year looked at the value that beaches add and the cost of beach closure to. And so there are ways of getting at this. The, the person who gave the talk before me, which unfortunately I wasn't able to see, I don't know if anyone was in here, Jens Ludwig, he talked about the urban, uh, ur urban poverty. And one of the things he does is map crimes. And that's another potential benefit that you could actually put a dollar value on. Reduced crime where you have community gardens or gardens where there's people working all the time. Yes. Well, this is massive health science center here, and it's exactly the same thing. Why is it so huge? Because it's paid for. It's subsidized by the National Institutes of Health. If you look at the number one growing epidemic in the United States, it's obesity. But obesity is much higher in food insecure areas mm -hmm. because of lack of access to what you just said. I'm wondering, couldn't it be a marriage, maybe you're doing this already, between what you're doing and the health sciences in terms of making this major change in what's causing this ill health to begin with? Yeah, that's, I mean, that's really a step that it's going right now. In fact, um, one of the neat things that have happened this past year or under the Obama administration is that there's been a reorganization of the USDA, and now they have a program, oh dear, it, NIFA, National Institutes for Food and Agriculture, and it's modeled after the National Institute of Health, but also involves a little bit of the NSF model in that they want to have hypothesis-driven science which is a change for the USDA. So they're kind of combining these to put the more, ask a question and demonstrate that you can get an answer to it. And they have this National Institutes of Health marriage saying, we recognize that f agriculture is food and food is a health issue. And so they are talking about that. One of the programs we're applying for funding for right now is global food security. And that's the idea getting yet trying to provide more food or getting people to make different dietary choices in these food insecure areas. And one way to do that is perhaps being involved in urban agriculture. We don't think urban agriculture is going to end up feeding a heck of a lot of people. But it can have wonders on touching a lot of people and trying to make changes that way. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm sorry. There's one here first. Okay. Yes. Um, in relation to when you talk about urban poverty, uh, when you do your economic analysis, it's part of any of your hypothesis whether this will make produce more available to low-income people? Is that part of what you're trying to do too? Because, or is it just people who go to Whole Foods already and they'll be able to get it locally, or is it people who can't afford to not afford yeah. Whole Foods who also should have access? Yeah, no, that's definitely in there. I mean, you guys are touching on all these issues that we just keep discovering day by day. And we just talked about this in terms of this uh, global food security. So there are a lot of uh, urban agriculture activities now. And one of the motivations for funding is revitalization of a neighborhood. So in that case, you could do that by providing food to Whole Foods. But that's not always the motivation. There is the motivation of affecting health and providing more food locally. And so we do. We want to see whether the economic viability, once you get, if you can get to economic viability, is it only going to be for the Whole Foods and high paying restaurants? Or will there be some food that can be available also for the lower, underserved, lower income underserved populations? And you know, it's a little scary to think that the answer might be no, that you know, it may be so expensive that. But again, I think things like growing homes program of work reentry, the, the, entering the workforce is a really good one. And Green City Youth is working with youths to push them that way. We're actually addressing the idea that farmers are moving off of farms and don't want to farm by trying to attract more youth into the idea of, of agriculture and showing that there is a link between the urban and the rural and sending them off to schools like U of I to become more involved. 
Did you talk about CSAs before? And, and I wonder how feasible it is that, you know, expand that network and rely on that network around the city. So the CSAs are a model that the farmers really favor. Um, it turns out that they're much less time consuming. So that actually gets into, um, oh, this challenge, it was up there already. The stages of the life cycle. So we're talking about the CSAs, community supported agriculture, that box that we got. Or um, the farmer's market is another point of distribution. What that's saying is that the farmers are not just doing production. They're actually doing marketing and delivery. And they actually actually take care of their waste. So they're uh, you know, affecting multiple stages of this life cycle. And the CSAs, they like in terms of time because there's much less time spent for them in this aspect of it. Particularly if they have one drop off point for their deliveries, they can pack out. It's very predictable. Um, they want to go, you know, right now most CAS, CSA memberships are for one year. There's farms experimenting with longer terms to have that reliability. It's interesting, one of the field trips we did with our students, some high school students last summer, was to go to the stock market and look at commodity trading. And we saw this parallel between the start of commodity trading and what CSAs are. And that's that the idea was that they wanted to have some reliability for selling their product. They wanted to have some sort of security in prices and market. And that's the same thing these farmers want for CSAs. Yes, exactly. And the model that they, the farmers seem to go towards is growing, growing their CSA and then they sell surplus or as they're growing they do the market to make up for that difference. And so they want to get, I mean it seems nearly universal with the few exceptions of very gregarious farmers who want to get away from the farmers market aspect and more to the CSA part of it. Um, restaurant sales is also very lucrative um, and so we see a lot of that. Um, that's one of the ways that the urban farms can really um, up their income is by selling this beautiful produce to restaurants. There's extremely high demand in Chicago for local produce grown from these farms. Yes? Yeah, I mean, you calculated earlier um, the, like, how much CO2 you save if you stop eating red meat. Mm -hmm. Have you done it for if you, if you switch from just eating produce from anywhere to eating local produce? That's the ultimate calculation we want to do, and that was the calculation that Weber and Matthews tried to do, but only assumed the transportation part. So what we realized is that we need to get a better handle on how a regional system would change each of those stages of the life cycle. And so right now we feel like, you know, as much as you can feel like an eight farms in one year, uh, that we got a little bit on the understanding of the agriculture production differences. We have some idea about transportation. I only touched on where the farms are, but we've actually done some survey work as well to get some better handle on that. So we're all the way two up into it. One other thing we really want to understand is how this is affecting consumption patterns. So whether people are eating less processed food, whether it's affecting waste or what's happening to that waste. And I think once we get through, so maybe one more season like this, we'll at least be able to get a better estimate and maybe do an update to what Weber's and Matthews did and say, okay, well, it's not just transportation. We have evidence that it's this changing, this changing, and this. And so this is what your efficiency difference is. Um, but yes? Uh, how much attention has been given to the place of the sustainability equipment? Local meat and milk. So milk production, I haven't personally looked at it all, and there seems to be people who are specializing just on that. That is one of the areas that you see um, the, uh, the land grant institutions working a little bit. Um, for the meat production, that's interesting and hard. So um, we noticed in our calculations, I didn't show here, but how you divide out that greenhouse gas footprint of meat and there's like a portion of it that's the energy use and then the other half of it is coming from methane emissions and it turns out that a study that came out of the Leopold Center in Iowa showed that grass-fed cattle were actually perhaps in terms of greenhouse gases um, a little worse than <laughs> the ones that were the conventional agriculture and that's because when they eat grasses at least in that region 
uh, they tend to burp more. And they're doing what cows do. I mean, they're meant to do this. They're not meant to be eating food and, and burping less. But unfortunately, that leads to higher greenhouse gas emissions. But that doesn't mean it's the bottom line. It only means it's the bottom line for, for that meat. Yes? I was wondering, like, when you get, like, juices out of fruits like apple or juice, yeah. does that increase or decrease the efficiency of it, or does it keep it the same? That's a good question. Um, it depends on the quality of the juice that you're juicing. So you tend to get different yields for juice fruits so that the enhanced yield that you get makes up for the fact that you're only having the juice portion of it. Um, and then it depends whether you're transporting it as a concentrated juice in like an aseptic, this is so silly that it's so detailed, <laughs> versus being in frozen. But the, that's the point in that there's so many different decision-making points along the way. So it can be just as efficient in some cases, um, less efficient in many others. Yeah? Uh, at the beginning you mentioned this was a US-based talk, but uh, as far as analogs of other countries that might be closer to where we want to go, like in France, in small cities where it's a lot more regional cuisine and local produce and farmer's market, have you looked at those as analogs or models for? I haven't looked at them. I had hoped that there was m something more of an analog. I do think that the European system is more what we want to think about. So the way agriculture developed in the US is very different. We were expanding. We had the West to move into. It wasn't necessarily a need for that food that grew. It was a need to expand into new areas and jobs. And it fed off of one another. We fed a higher growing population. So it was always about expanding. And in the Europe, it's much further along. It's a more in that sustainable, not meaning sustainable in terms of environmental, but in a sustainable state. And so in that sense, it is more of an analog to where we are. And that, I think, is why we ultimately is a good time to re-envision the food system, because we never envisioned it at the state we are now, where we're more de the cities are developed and we need to understand and provide it, because this is the way the configuration is. But they're not as far along as, as one would imagine. I mean, they're a little bit further ahead in the same research we're doing, but that's about it. You know, we actually collaborate with someone, and we just are about to collaborate in the Netherlands on urban agriculture. So, yes? This might be a digression, but let us say that the population of the world doubles in the next 20 years. What's this going to do with the food situation? I think it will take some of the dietary choice away from big portions of the population. We can't s sustain the kind of meat consumption we have currently. You cannot sustain that population, that larger population in the system that we have now and expect that everyone's level of meat consumption is going to tend upwards towards where ours is. Please join me in thanking oh. Professor Martin.